<clears throat> Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church just down the road here about a quarter of a mile on your left as you go down 221 back toward Lawrence. Uh, and friends, I come out here this afternoon with the expressed intention of bringing to you the gospel of grace, of heralding forth the gospel of salvation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. It is quite fitting for me to do so, especially during this time of the year, when even the pagans will mark this time, mark this season of celebration of the birth of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Many will gather with their families and even perhaps read out of the very scriptures themselves the story of God's incarnation, the second person of the Trinity, coming down in human flesh to save His people from their sins. It's quite incredible, really, that we have this holiday. And so how fitting it is that I'd be able to preach as we draw near to this most precious season of the year, to preach concerning the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom all things have been made and by whom all things have been made. I seek this afternoon to make known exactly what Christ has done for His people in coming to save them. That through His perfect life, He has accomplished for them a perfect righteousness. He has procured for them a righteousness that is not their own. Through His own death, He has taken away their sin. Through His resurrection, He has guaranteed their resurrection and the, and the fact that He's put away their sin. And through His intercession, that He lives to be their intercessor at the right hand of the Father on high. I seek to exalt God today by making known this gospel, this gospel of grace, this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I seek to do it not only that you yourselves might benefit from it, that is, that you might be saved, or for those of you who are Christian, if there would be any here today, would be encouraged in the faith. No, that is not only, those are not the only intentions I have, but chiefly my desire, the cry of my heart is to bring God the glory. Because the preaching of the gospel of His Son brings His name glory. It brings God glory for people to speak of the work of His Son. It brings God glory to speak of His sovereignty over salvation. That He, oh God, that he saves those whom He chooses and whom He wills to save by His grace and for His glory. So therefore, do not be hard-hearted. Do not resist the preaching of the gospel. Rather, soften your hearts. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and be attentive to the word of the Lord as it goes forth. Be attentive to the word of the gospel. That you yourselves might be saved by it. For as Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The, the gospel is God's power to salvation, for sinners' salvation, my friends. He says in the next verse, Romans 1.17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Salvation is brought about by faith. And that's what I want to look at this afternoon. It is accomplished. Christ is apprehended. He is, as it were, His salvation is received by faith. Faith, my friends. The text of Scripture that I would like to consider this reality of faith from is found in Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. Paul here is speaking of salvation and specifically of that thing, faith. He says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. May God bless the preaching of His Word. 500 years ago, in the year of 1517, a German monk by the name of Martin Luther took and nailed a document entitled his 95 Theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, thus sparking the Protestant Reformation five centuries ago, my friends. That sparked a revolution 
People began to read the scriptures for themselves. For up until that time, at least for the past few hundred years, the scriptures had been kept away from the modern, the, the, the common man. As it were, there was very little access to the scriptures in one's own tongue. But rather, it was really only for those who had access to it and were able to read the language that it was at that time in, that being Latin. However, a man by the name of Martin Luther was studying the scriptures and he realized that the Catholic Church was wrong on a lot of things, on most things, in fact, especially on salvation. But specifically at that time, the error he was pointing out was their error with indulgences. The idea of buying, literally buying with money, forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. It was heresy. Heresy. It was a lie. He protested it, thus bringing about the term Protestant. And as I said, it began a revolution of people studying the Scriptures for themselves, learning the truth of the Word of God. And within a few years' time, there were men of renown standing for the truth of the Gospel. Martin Luther, one of them, who two years later was converted. Converted by reading Romans 1.17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And as, as it is written, But the righteous man shall live by faith. He was saved by believing that the righteousness of God was given to him as a gift of grace and that he would be saved on account of the work of Christ. Two years later in 1519, God saved that man, Martin Luther. And here we are today. Really, we could attribute the beginning of America itself, the foundation of American society upon Protestantism. That's how important the Protestant Reformation was. It changed the world, literally. It brought society out of a dark age. Most importantly, a spiritual dark age. And praise be to God, His gospel was recovered amongst the ruins, amongst the mess of the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the chief points of Protestant theology during the Reformation was a term that is called sola fide. It is a Latin phrase, and it means faith alone. The reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, other men and women, stood up for this truth, that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That it is not by our religious performance. It is not by being good enough as the Roman Catholic Church, in essence, said. No, but it is of grace. It is by faith, believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why you must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, so that you might be saved, my friends, that you might have eternal life in the Son of God. I plead with you to come to Christ and live. For Jesus Himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even if He dies. Friends, Christ is a sufficient Savior, a powerful Savior, a glorious Savior. All who believe on Him are saved from their sin, saved by His grace. But going back there to the Protestant Reformation, that was one of the phrases, one of the slogans of the Protestant Reformation. Faith alone, sola fide. Friends, you can only be reconciled to God by faith in His Son alone, apart from your merit and your work. We ask ourselves, how is Christ apprehended? We know from Scripture that He died and rose again, but how does one receive the benefit of His work? The Reformers will answer you the same way as the Scriptures do, and it is by faith, by faith. And that is what I want to make known this afternoon. And ultimately the gospel that we are to place our faith in. For it is not just a generic faith that we're to place in anything. It's faith in Christ, the true Christ. That is the way we are saved. But before I do that, I want to contemplate the context here of Romans 3. In Romans 3, Paul is discussing the issue of conversion, of salvation. 
He's already, the, uh, earlier on in the chapter, talked about Christ's work, talked about how Christ has accomplished redemption for His people. And then he brings, in verse 27, this reality to bear. He says, what then is boast, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. How are we saved, my friends? By faith. Paul says that. He continues in verse 27. Or, excuse me, in verse 28, which is what I want to consider this morning. Or this afternoon. Concerning sola fide. Faith alone. It is the article upon which the church stands or falls. And it is the article upon which you stand or you fall. Verse 28 says, For we maintain... This is Paul himself and his associates. The men and women who stood with him in ministry. The apostles, those men of renown that he preached alongside with. They all maintained the same gospel. It was not a different gospel. They didn't all have their own ideas of what was the good news of Christ. It was all the same. It was unified. The church has always been unified, the true church that is, around the true gospel. There are many Gospels, my friends, but only one true Gospel, well, only one saving Gospel. In fact, what did Paul tell the Galatians, Galatians 1? He said these words in Galatians 1, in verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a Gospel, contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Greek word, anathema. He is to be damned. Why? Because the false Gospel doesn't save. Only the true gospel. What is that? The true gospel is not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. The gospel is that Jesus came to die for sinners and was buried and was raised on the third day for sinners. And that all who believe on that are saved from their sin. Christ came to save us from sin. Not to give us an easy life. Not to give us worldly pleasure. But to save us from sin. But listen, Paul continues, verse 19, As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. This is serious, friends. This is serious for me to stand up here and to share with you this gospel because I, I must be accurate. It must be the true gospel. It cannot be a false gospel. If it is, you and I are both lost. If you believe it, then I'm preaching it. So going back to verse 28 of Romans 3, for we maintain that a man is justified. Justification, it's a large word and we typically don't use it in our modern uh, lingo, modern language, in the modern vernacular, it's, it's typically not employed. But the word justified typically means to make righteous. However, in this context, in this book of Romans, it means to regard as righteousness, to, uh, to regard as righteous. To regard as right. To treat as right. See, the Roman Catholic Church in Martin Luther's day, and even, to our, even in this very day, their conception of the doctrine of justification is that a man is made right with God through the sacraments. Through the sac seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. They are made righteous. Actually made righteous. And then they are saved after they are made righteous. But Scripture says men are regarded, they are declared by God as righteous on account of the work of His Son. See, it's, it's the difference between salvation by work, salvation by religious performance, and salvation by grace. In Martin Luther's day, the Roman Catholic Church said it was by work, by performing the sacraments. In fact, we know the, the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Trent, Canon 9, says that if any man believes we are saved by faith, he is anathema. But that's contrary to what Paul said in Galatians. He said, if anyone preaches you a contrary gospel, he is anathema. And the contrary gospel would be a gospel that says you are saved by your work. 
So a man is regarded as righteous. He is treated by God as if he is righteous because Christ has performed righteously in his stead, in his room, on his behalf. And so the Father can look upon the sinner as righteous in his sight. That's the gospel. That is sola fide. That is faith alone. And that is the only gospel that will save. Paul later on said in Romans 4, 4, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. How are we saved according to Paul's Gospel? By not working but believing in Him who justifies the ungodly. That is how a man is saved. Excuse me. Mm. All by grace, my friends. And it is ordered this way that God might receive the glory because we must understand this. God is a jealous God. Nahum 1 tomb tells us that. We also know from Deuteronomy 4, God is a jealous God. What is he jealous for? His own glory. He's jealous for his own glory to receive praise and honor and worship to his great name. And so when we look at salvation, it is all of God's grace so that God receives the glory. That's the purpose of it. He continues, he says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith, as I have already said many times thus far, by faith. Two Greek words are often used in the New Testament, pistis, pistuo, typically translated as belief or faith. And they're both derived from a, a root word in Greek that means to persuade to persuade. It's a divine persuasion of God. See, faith is a gift of God. It's not something we conjure up within ourselves. Faith in its, in its nature, in its essence, is granted to the sinner by God. It's not something that they bring about by their own power, by their own strength, by their own ingenuity. It is by grace. What does Ephesians 2.8 say? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And then he says this, and that not of yourselves. Faith is not something that man can conjure up within himself. But then what does he say? Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. How does that happen? By the Spirit. The Spirit of God grants the sinner faith in the Gospel of Christ. That's how a man apprehends Christ. It's not as if one day he chooses by his own volition to come to Christ, for he never will. He hates Christ. Lost men hate Christ. If you're outside of Christ, you're the enemy of God. That's why you must come to Him so that you might be reconciled to God through the death of His Son. So faith is a gift of God. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift from God, indeed. He says, apart from the works of the law. Apart from the works of the law. That is, it is not by man's effort, as I have already mentioned. Not by his work. Not by his strength or power. But by the might of God. In fact, we know that our good works 
certainly do not get us into the kingdom of God. They do not justify us. No one is good enough to make it into God's kingdom. What do we find in Isaiah 64 verse 6? It says, for all, for all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us like, or excuse me, all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Incredible. Our good deeds before God are seen as filthy rags, as an affront, an offense to Him that we would even think we could offer up such things as the basis for our justification. We cannot, my friends. We cannot. Apart from the works of the law. Not just not just general good works as we would conceive them, but specifically con conforming to God's law. No man can be saved by conforming to God's law. Now why is that? Very simple. Because he can't keep the law of God. Any so-called law keeping that he has to his name is imperfect. You know this yourself. Your conscience bears witness with this reality that you have broken God's law, that you have done that which you know is wrong before in your life. That in your own life, throughout the years that you have had on this earth, you have sinned. For God has said you shall not lie, steal, blaspheme, fornicate, commit adultery. But you and I, myself both, I'm not exempting myself from this, friends. And I say that because I care for you. This is something that we all find ourselves in. This is the predicament that we are in, each of us. We cannot be justified by God's law because we cannot keep it. It's not that God's law is something that's wrong with it, that there's an inherent evil aspect to it. No, it's pure. We know from the Psalms, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. God's law is good. And it is a delight of the believer. We know from Psalm 1-2 that the righteous man delights in the law of the Lord and on it he meditates day and night. However, friends, we see that we cannot keep it. And therefore, salvation must be of grace. It must be by faith. Salvation must be outside of us and brought to us, not found in us. There's often people will think, well, there's spiritual truth in me. I just have to search deep enough. I have to discover my inner self, as it were. No, my friends, spiritual truth is not inherent in us. It's outside of us. Spiritual truth is found in the Word of God, found in special revelation, in the Scriptures, Old and New Testament. The only infallible rule of faith and practice. That is how we understand spiritual truth. That's how we even know spiritual truth. By the Word of God. But who is this God who offered, who authored this law? Who is the God who caused this law to be written? That is His Ten Commands. He is Yahweh. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the Lord, the Lord, strong and mighty, mighty in power. Exodus 4 tells us, God here is speaking to Moses. Verse 6 it says, the Lord here is speaking, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, or excuse me, for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. God is a holy God, a righteous God, a just God. 
He is gracious and compassionate as that text very clearly said. And we see God's generic grace and mercy revealed even toward the wicked in creation. We see even on a day like this where the weather is just about perfect. And yet there are many of you who are wicked and know not Christ. And yet you, just as I am, are experiencing this day. It speaks to the grace and mercy of God even upon the ungodly. Even upon the ungodly, my friends. We know from the Psalms that His mercies are over all His works. But God has shown special kindness in sending His Son to save sinners from slavery to their sin. And so I plead with you to believe, to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16.31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Acts 4.12, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. No other name but Christ. No other salvation but that which is in Christ. My friends, your hope needs to be found in Christ alone. Christ alone. Not in your religious performance, but in the Son of God who performed already for sinners. God is such a righteous, perfect God. Righteous in all His ways. Thank you very much. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. Perfect in all His ways and all His deeds. Friends, comprehend this. Understand this. God is all-powerful. He created the world in six days, some 6,000 years ago. All things have been made by Him and for Him. And in His holiness, as I said earlier, He gave His law. He gave His Ten Commandments, His statutes. Let us go to Exodus 20 where they are given. God gives His law there. Verse 3, He says, You shall have no other gods before Me. Go down to verse 12, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Verse 13, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Friends, these commands of God are, are from Himself and they are in accordance with His righteous character. These things show us how God is righteous. How He is holy. How He is pure. That He hates lying and thievery and blasphemy. And He is jealous for all praise and honor. And as, as I said earlier, these commands, my friends, show us not only God's character, but our character in light of the character of God. Our sin in light of the holiness of God. For we ourselves find that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God when we consider His law. Ask yourself, do you worship other things rather than the true God? Material possessions, pleasures. Have you disobeyed your parents before? That, dis that is a breaking of God's law. Have you murdered? You say, no. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, God sees you as a murderer, holds you as accountable as the same. Commit adultery. You ever committed adultery? You say no. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you've looked at a woman with lust, or for you women, if you looked at a man with lust, you've committed adultery already with him in your heart. See, God sees the heart, friends. He sees the heart of man. What does he see? Intrinsic evil, intrinsic perversion. He does not see that our hearts are good. He sees that we are unrighteous and unworthy to enter into His presence. Ask yourself, have you ever stolen? If so, then you have broken the transgression of God. You have broken the law of God. And all thieves will be damned for their sin. Have you lied? 
Have you borne false witness against your neighbor? If so, the scriptures say every liar. All liars will have their place in the lake of fire. For their sin. For their law breaking. God's punishment for sin is hell. We break His law, we deserve the punishment. If a murderer here in South Carolina kills somebody, they deserve to be punished. If a thief steals, they deserve to be punished. If you get a speeding ticket, you have to pay it. How much more God, the Holy One of Israel, the perfect, righteous One, how much more does He require of us that we not sin against Him and when we do, we deserve punishment for it. Jesus spoke about hell more than He did about heaven. Because He loved sinners and wanted to warn them about it. He wanted to warn them about the punishment of hell. About the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of torment for the ungodly. The place of outer darkness. The place which I do not want you to go to. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these will go away into eternal life. He's speaking there of the righteous. But the oh, excuse me, but these will go away into eternal punishment. He's speaking of the wicked. Then he says concerning the righteous, but the righteous into eternal life. So we have the righteous going into heaven, but then what? The wicked, the lawbreakers, the sinners are lost in hell forever. And that is the most fearful aspect of hell, is that it never ends. The torments of those who are damned never stop, but they continue on for a thousand generations throughout all eternity because they've offended an infinitely holy God. So truly the state of man is hopeless, is helpless, is dire. We're in a dire strait, my friends. A dire strait indeed. We are in a terrifying situation. For we are sinners in the hands of an angry God by default. But friends, I have good news. God is rich and mercy. He is rich in mercy, my friends, as Ephesians 2.4 says. He has a great love for His church. A love that is in accordance with His righteousness. From the foundation of the world, He set aside a people to Himself that He would save and left the rest to continue in their sin and to be lost for it forever. But He set aside a remnant. He set aside His church. To use the biblical term, He predestined them to glory. As Ephesians 1.5 says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. To the praise of the glory of His grace. And before the world was made, in eternity past, the Father commissioned the Son. He commissioned the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and to die for this select people. To die for this group of sinners. This poor, miserable lot of wretches. And Jesus Christ, being obedient and perfect, submitted to the plan of the Father, submitted to the will of the Father, He kept the charge. He kept the command as the Father required of Him to do so. How powerful, how wonderful is that? That Christ, before the world was made, knew that He would come and die for His people, for the Father had ordained it. Jesus said in John chapter 10 that His sheep are those whom the Father gave Him. Believers are a gift from the Father to the Son. And the Son redeems them, makes them His bride, and then presents them back to the Father as a church, holy, harmless, undefiled, perfectly presentable. presentable.
So when the fullness of the times came to use the phrase Paul employs in Galatians 4.4, 4, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Friends, if you know not Christ, you must know Him. You must know of His salvation lest you be lost. If you're living in a life of sin, rebellion and iniquity, and you know that you're headed for hell, come, repent and believe the Gospel. Have life in Christ. Or if you are a Christian, my encouragement to you is to look to Christ once more. To share the Gospel with the lost. To obey Christ. If you want to please Him, obey Him. Obey Him. Jesus sent His disciples out in Matthew 28, 19 to go and make disciples of all nations. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. What is the essence of discipleship, brethren? It is obedience to Christ. Obey Him. He is worthy. He is worthy. History is His story. All things have been made for His glory. Christ is all. All that the believer needs. All that the believer needs. So look. Christ came and fulfilled the law on behalf of the elect. As I said, those whom the Father gave Him, He fulfilled the law for them with the intent of saving them. See, we, we can't obey the law and God requires that we obey the law. He requires that we live obediently. So Jesus comes in and does it for us. He lives obediently for us so that the Father might credit that righteousness to sinners by grace. Grace, grace, grace. Every moment of every day of Jesus' life, He lived in perfect submission to the will of the Father. The two greatest commands Jesus said are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We never can keep those even for a split second. And Christ kept them for His entire life. And then He went to the cross. He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God because of His love for His bride. Paul tells the husbands at Ephesus in Ephesians 5.25, he says, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her, Jesus has such a great love for His church. A great love for His church. He laid Himself down, was beat, was whipped, was spat upon, was made a public mockery, and bore the wrath of the Father against the sins of the elect. He was regarded as a sinner, though He in fact is righteous, perfect in all His ways. Isaiah 53 says in verse 5, I shall begin in verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried, yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed. The Father credited to Christ the sins of the elect upon the cross. He treated Christ as if He had committed all of the sin of His people. And then He bore the wrath of the Father against that sin. He bore the wrath of God against that sin. That's why Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Friends, Christ Jesus bore the wrath of God. You can be saved from your sins, saved from the impending judgment by looking to Christ. By looking to the Lord Jesus Christ who died bearing upon Himself the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God. That is wonderful. 
as the hymn puts it, upon that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Three days later, He was vindicated because He did not die guilty. He died as a righteous, innocent man, but He was regarded, He was treated by the Father as if guilty. So the Father vindicated Him. He raised Him up. He raised Him up. He is alive today and forevermore. Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man, the God-man, the eternal Son of the living God. Forty days later, He was exalted in glory at the right hand of the Father on high, having accomplished redemption, having done what we could not do for ourselves. He did for His people. He sat down as the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The call of the Gospel is that sinners repent and believe it. Repentance is simply that we see our sin. We see that we are sinners and we endeavor to flee that sin. We endeavor to turn from that which displeases God. And faith, belief is simply taking God at His Word. Believing that what God said He was able to do, He did and He will do in us. We know from the book of Romans in Romans 4 that Paul gives us a very good example of faith and that is the life of Abraham. This is what he says concerning Abraham's life, verse 19 of Romans 4. He says, Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, listen to this, being fully assured that what God had promised, He was able also to perform. Saving faith is a gift of God, my friends. You cannot bring this about in your own heart. God has to grant you repentance and faith. God has to first work in you. He has to draw you to His Son, otherwise you would never come. I would never come. We are born as God-haters. Jesus said in John 6, 44, No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Dear friends, flee to Christ. The, right, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Safe, my friends. Safe in the arms of Jesus. For those who repent and believe, their sin is forgiven. Past present and future. All sin, all iniquity, all rebellion, my friends, all of it, not some, all of it, all of the grace of God, that God might get glory in it. And He truly does. Incredible. All by grace. All by grace. Father forgives them of all sin and credits them with the righteousness of Christ. That is, He looks upon them as if they lived Jesus' life. See, as I said earlier, what is justification? It is God regarding the sinner as righteous, treating them as righteous, declaring them righteous. And how does He do that? On account of the work of His Son. On account of the work of the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how they're justified. That's how sinners are declared righteous. Because of what Christ has done. So trust in the finished work of Christ alone, my friends. That you might be saved by God's grace. For it is truly all of grace. Indeed and indeed. And for those who are truly saved, they have now a new nature. With a new heart and new desires. Paul talks about in the book of Titus. He says in verse uh, chapter 3, uh, verse, uh, verse 5, he says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Those who are saved not only are justified, not only are declared righteous, regarded as righteous, but what else? They are regenerated. They are recreated. They are a new creation in Christ. They now have a new nature, a new heart with new desires, new behaviors, new inclinations, new affections. They now love the Word of God. They now love prayer. They now love biblical theology. They love the fellowship of the saints. They love holiness. They love the church. They love to attend church. Why? Because God has worked in their hearts. 
They hate sin. They're broken over sin. They're disgusted with their sin. That's a true Christian. And if what I'm describing to you is alien to you, is foreign to you, and you've never heard of it, and you say you're a Christian, you're not. If this is not a reality in your life, if you don't know Christ, if you're not living for Christ, you don't know Him. See, friends, it's not that we're justified by our works, but our works prove where our heart truly is. They prove what we truly believe. They prove whether our faith is legitimate or not. So look at yourself. Examine yourself to see whether you are a true Christian. If you say that you're a Christian, look at your life. Look at your thoughts. Look at the way you talk. Look at your behavior. Do you love Christ? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love? As Ephesians 6 says. Or instead, do you live as a hypocrite? You love your sin. You don't care anything about holiness. If so, then you're lost. You need to repent and believe the gospel. You need to renounce your pseudo-Christianity and become a true religious person. Truly religious. But if you look at your life and you clearly see God has given you a new nature, a new heart with new desires, then blessed be God Most High. Blessed be the Lord of hosts that He has done this great work in you. For He is to be praised indeed. He indeed is to be praised. And the gospel is not only for the lost, but for the child of God to feed upon, to rest in, and to proclaim brethren. Those of you who are true Christians, share the gospel with the lost. Preach Christ and Him crucified to your unconverted family members and friends that they themselves might experience the same salvation you have. It is all by grace. All by grace. Ultimately, that God might receive the glory. That's the purpose in it. That's the purpose of all things. To bring... God glory. Paul said in First Timothy chapter six, verse thirteen, he tells Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which He will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only Sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immort immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man can see, has seen or can see, to Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Indeed, to Christ Jesus be all glory forever. Amen. Amen. You who are lost, you unconverted souls, you pagans, come to Christ. Renounce your life of sin, sexual immorality and drunkenness, and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You who say that you know Christ. You who say yourselves to be Christians. Examine yourselves. Look at your life. Do you truly love Christ? Do you truly strive for holiness or are you just a hypocrite? Like most people in churches. If so, you need to be saved. Repent and believe the gospel. If you do know Christ though, my dear brethren, share this gospel. Publish this gospel. Live on the gospel. Feed upon it. Preach it to your own heart and soul. We need it desperately, brethren. We need it desperately. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, that a man is regarded as righteous. He is justified by faith. By faith, apart from the works of the law. Sola fide. Faith alone. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Friends, we have sinned against the Holy One. We have broken His law. We deserve hell for our sin. But Christ came into the world and died for sinners and was raised on the third day. And all who embrace Him will be saved. All who repent and believe upon Him will be saved. 
by His grace and for His glory. He made all things for His glory. And especially in salvation, it is by grace. It is by faith. It is faith alone that He might receive all the glory alone. So to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three, three in one, the same in essence, equal in power and glory. To the only true God be all glory, both now and forevermore, in all things. Amen and amen.